Welcome to our new video series, A Beginner's Guide for Brands. What is Embedded Finance? In this video series, powered by Finastra, we speak to a series of experts to take a closer look at banking as a service, the scale of the opportunities provided by Embedded Finance, where it's already having an impact, partnerships, and actual use cases. Hi Lars, uh, thanks for taking the time. I want to talk about embedded finance a little bit, and there is a lot of talk about embedded finance. Um, can you give us a view as to the scale of the opportunity of embedded finance and, and some of the numbers that are being touted in the industry across various use cases are yeah. quite large. Um, what's your view? Yeah, uh, thanks. First of all, thanks, thanks for having me. And I, I, I completely resonate with what, what you're saying. I think one of the biggest number that we often hear around embedded finance is this number of $7 trillion. Uh, that's very often like right. the discussion comes back to, is it really that big? And for me, is it, since I'm, I'm focusing full time on embedded finance since 2020 and being in this bubble, so to say, sometimes I when I consume um, news pieces or looking at certain things, sometimes also like, like differentiate a little bit the hype from the reality. And I think there were moments definitely where there was a, a lot of hype, but at the end of it, um, I completely see that embedded, like for me also like to focus on better finance is a very specific reason. I see the the time is really right. A lot of the requirements for something for embedded finance, and when I refer to embedded finance, obviously referring to the non-financial brands offering financial products. And after mm -hmm. having been in fintech for quite some time, uh, I see now is the right time for using this channel of the non-financial brands to offer financial product. Um, if you're asking me, is it really $7 trillion? Uh, I, I haven't checked the numbers. I haven't run the numbers. If it really that big, but I think it's a it's a good enough number in the way that it kind of shows that where the potential can go. I think when we look at something like embedded finance, which is so broad with so many different mm -hmm. financial products, so many different geographies, so many different industries, I think the number is like fitting in a way to show that it's it's bigger than maybe some of us might 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 uh, might anticipate in a way of like what we are seeing in our in our daily lives. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. But you know, why do you think uh, you know it's a time for embedded finance now. Yeah. What do you think is driving it? Um, that's a very good question. I think there are, there are a few things coming together, but if I were to highlight, I would highlight two things. Firstly, it's definitely technology. Um, mm -hmm. I think we have seen concept like banking as a service since quite some time. And I've seen it now in the last past years that providers, infrastructure providers are really understanding that they need to build a very specific product for non-financial brands. I'm completely mm -hmm. of the opinion that uh, banking as a service as part of banking embedded finance, but also similar in the other financial products, that the initial providers had a very strong focus on companies who understood their business, the financial service industry inside out. But it requires a very different product when you're dealing with people who don't have the knowledge, who don't have the staff, who don't have the uh, all the background knowledge that you have. So the product has to be like work very differently and behave very differently. And I think that's first of all what infrastructure, infrastructure providers are doing now. And obviously they have seen that there is a demand happening for that. And I'm, secondly, I'm sure the demand is at the moment happening because in fintech, from my point of view, we have gone through like a little bit of different waves. I personally joined fintech in around 2014, and it might have not, not a big, not not been exactly at that point of time, but around that time, I would say that the the first wave of the fintech uh, industry that we're talking about now today is, uh, started around that time. And back then, I remember all the startups were saying like, "We're going to disrupt banks. We don't need banks. Right. We can do all of the better, better. We just need like our us fintech companies." Then a couple of years, a little bit like realization happening. Okay, all of us have to fight with the same problem. We have to get customers. It's really, really hard. And a lot of the corporations right. started with, finan with, with fintech startup and banks. And I see now the embedded finance trend as a logical next step of um, existing non-financial brands uh, taking a bit over, not completely replacing, but taking a bit over of the role of a fintech startup and collaborating with banks, with financial institution, and kind of bringing the the, the thing of both sides, the, the best of both worlds basically together, the financial, the non-financial brands with their understanding of their customers, with a very often very uh, unique and specific product for, for right. the non-financial part, and then the financial institution, the infrastructure provider who's bringing in the, the knowledge and understanding of how financial products work and both that together i feel uh is is is, is right now the, the the right time yeah yeah no i i would agree you know maybe maybe what we can do is let's just double click a little bit on some of the specific use cases early on you said you know embedded finance is 
wide, broad, and deep. Yeah, still yeah. evolving. Um, and some of the use cases that Finastra that we are uh, we are focusing on, and one of them is lending, embedded yeah. lending. Um, you know, embedded. As soon as we talk about embedded lending, people think of BNPL, right? It, yeah. Which is you know relatively low ticket transaction in a more traditional point of sale, etc. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? B, and and more specifically beyond BNPL, um, yeah. What sort of use cases are you seeing in embedded lending, and and what's your view on embedded lending particularly? Yeah. So I think like from a, from a, from a high level perspective. I think that applies to a lot of the areas of embedded finance. I mean, it's not exclusively, but I think a lot of the use cases, specifically that we need to see today, is on the right. on the on the corporate side. Uh, so business use cases. Of, of course, we're also seeing consumer solutions quite a lot. But I think, uh, especially on the lending side, I've been I've been looking at projects where I think embedded lending is very often not replacing an existing lending product, but rather enabling a company to take a loan, to take a financial product, a financing product, which was previously not able to get it or didn't want right. to go through the hassle to obtain it. And that that thing, this is, I mean, it might also be in parts true for other financial products, like in, in banking or maybe in insurance and investing. Uh, but I think especially in lending, it's a the massive use cases. And I think specifically uh, around around marketplaces, around vertical SaaS, um, these kind of companies who very often develop very specific solutions for the customer on the non-financial part, but still very often have touching points with financial data. They perhaps know, I mean, I'm just remembering um, a vertical SaaS provider focusing on the, or different providers focusing on the construction industry, uh, craftsmen, all around that. They have a lot of details about like what business they're doing, what 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 volume they're doing, what the project size is. And very yeah. often fin financing is a very, very important piece of that. And the question is then how to, how to package that. And very often, I don't know, the companies, maybe applied at the bank and didn't get a loan or perhaps uh, didn't even consider it, but we're not really sure if they're really uh, eligible to get a loan and didn't want to go through the whole process of like kind of asking and then did it getting a decline. But when this when this opportunity of financing product is offered you just at the right point at the right time, and a lot of the yeah. work from your side is done already with pre-filled data and all of that, right. uh, I think that's where we will see a lot of like additional usage of financing product compared to a pre-embedded world. That's yeah. least how, how how I see it. Yeah, Lars, I I would agree. You know, as an example, I think the the point you raised about specialty and the vertical specific capabilities versus generic um, is something that I would definitely uh, agree. As an example, right um, at Finastra, we just a couple of weeks ago we launched a specific. This is in the consumer lending space. Yeah. Uh, we had a partnership. We have a partnership with Lone Star. And and Seattle Bank and Finastra sits in between, uh, and that particular embedded lending solution is a consumer loan, mm -hmm. uh, but specifically for home improvement. Um, you know when when you know contractors offer this service to the end customer to upgrade their home, uh, it's seamless. So to your point about uh, something being vertical specific and offering this service right yeah. at the time where the consumers are making those decisions, is really where. Uh, I think the the trick really is versus a generic product. So I would definitely agree. And and uh, there are lots of stakeholders, right? If you, if you, if you, if if I may point you to the consumer lending side for yeah. a second, and there are lots of stakeholders. There are retailers, there are manufacturers, uh, marketplaces, aggregators, and of course the end consumer and the bank. Like, yeah. uh, could you talk a little bit about like who is driving this? Uh, more actively among the various, uh, you know, stakeholders and ecosystem players. How what are you seeing? Um, uh, personally, I would say, I mean, specifically, I think financial institution banks infrastructure providers. I mean, maybe not all banks and financial institutions have understood the opportunity, but I think there is there's a good amount who are who are understanding the scope. I think what we all have to do uh, as a, the joint community, so to say, is obviously like sharing the potential, sharing the opportunity, and also be very open and transparent. This is this is not a like switch it on and it's done kind of thing. Uh, right. and, and you as a, in, the, in your example, maybe a home, home improvement company um, would be able to, to benefit of that. It might be for some of them a journey as well and to figure out what the right product is. I think at the end of it, 
it's with every with every digital product, right? You have to start with a customer. I mean, this is basically like if there's there's no embedded finance solution will will win if it's just for the sake of it, right? right. Uh, it, there has to be a benefit for the customer, um, and obviously uh, a journey, a, a digital journey work with customers, perhaps. And I was just speaking to a company in, in a in a similar space as well. Um, they're offering financing for for solar panels here here in Europe um, yeah. on the on on the consumer uh, side, right? And obviously um, there might be a lot of company, a lot of a lot of individuals who are interested in such products, but the question of like financing has to be there right and this i think this company what i spoke to who was uh, an infrastructure company their challenge was not their challenge but what they currently like faced is that they have to doing like a quite a lot of education with these companies who are selling the sonar panels so i think this is a little bit like the the educational effort that i meant where the at the end of it, the front end the non-financial brands they have to be the ones who have to be able to transfer an accurate correct uh, and uh, detailed enough uh, details around the the financial product that can be consumed, how it can be consumed. But they, they, at the end of it, if they if they don't promote it, uh, then nobody will use embedded fin finance products, right? So they 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 are the key stakeholders. And I think um, that we have seen many of them. I mean, in the US, maybe like maybe companies like Walmart um, on the more traditional side, obviously Shopify and Toast on the tech side are good companies for doing that. Uh, but I think the the really interesting impact will then happen when uh, the broader broader scope of like also non-tech companies understand this uh, and i think this is what we also do as a community to to educate them about the possibilities and uh, and guide them to the right path yeah no i i would agree i mean this is this is one where it takes more than a few to tango so to speak uh, for this to evolve and that's that's definitely happening now sure. um, if i if i may pivot a little bit into another use case the, the yeah. second uh, use case the, uh, that we are focusing on is is alternate cross-border payments. Yeah. Uh, alternative to SWIFT, obviously. Um, what are you seeing in the alternate cross-border payments space? And and how what are some of the use cases that you're seeing um, in that space, cross-border space space? Yeah, again, like I mean, like for, for my for my personal experience with the project that I've seen is um, it was a bit again a bit more on the on the corporate side. Um, mm -hmm. I think uh, at, at the, the nature of is an, an international cross-border payment, um, I think is very interesting because, I mean, very often financial products are very commoditized and it's really hard to charge money for them, right? I mean, look at like consumer bank accounts, um, maybe right. in, specifically in Germany or in Europe, but also generally around the world. It's sometimes very hard to charge for it, right? And companies have to come up, companies who want to offer such product have to come up um, with with a business case and how to monetize that, right? Have to package it somehow um, so they're able to monetize on that. Uh, the interesting piece about um, foreign exchange or like the, the international transfer pieces, uh, People are used to paying for it, and it's uh, uh, it's a potential for the companies who are offering it to actually monetize it directly. And I think that's uh, again on the corporate side, uh, solutions I've or I've dealt with or looked at is again a lot on the on the vertical vertical SaaS side, where companies looking at uh, uh, invoicing, accounting, uh, especially when it's like use cases that are typically a little bit more international, where it's about like financing of products, or working capital finances, where people are importing products, uh, all these kind of things were um, in. International transfer baked into the system, baked into the into this uh, tool that you're using for for conducting some of these efforts internationally makes just a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you know I, that's definitely one area, and the other area that we are starting to see a little bit is even on the consumer to consumer cross border mm -hmm. payments, where and also the low ticket, uh, low value cross border payments, where traditional models like SWIFT become very expensive. And, exactly. and they don't have the transparency of uh, the time and cost and fees, et cetera, et cetera. And we are starting to see um, use cases emerging. And you know, Finastra is definitely playing in a number of those uh, with number of those partners. So it is yeah. definitely an area that we see a lot of promise in solving. To your point about a a, a client problem at the end of the day. Yeah. It's not so much of okay, you have this capability and let's go find nails. It's at the end of the we have the hammer, let's go find nails. It's at the at the end of the day, what is the value and what is the problem that we are trying to solve for, whether it's a commercial client or a consumer client. Yeah. Um, so you know, the, you know, broadly speaking, right? If you look back, do the non-financial brands, whether it is you know distributors or you know whoever, uh, do they see the potential of 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 uh, embedded finance and and uh, you know is it still evolving like how, you know yeah. are there differences between the US versus Europe? Um, could you talk a little bit more? For sure, and I think there's 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 a 
as a vast difference and I think geographically is definitely one, but I think also very specifically industries um, and the, the, cost, the type of customers each company is addressing, right? Um, obviously, there are, I mean, there are certain kind of role models in embedded finance that a lot of companies look out for and that might be companies like in the US, like, like Shopify or Toast. And obviously companies, I can tell you that, companies who operate in a similar space here in Germany, of course, then look at these examples abroad and kind of consider like, is there something to adapt, right? If you are in an yeah. industry where perhaps there's not been any companies like doing something like embedded finance, it might be for you a little bit like questionable, okay, should you really be the first one who is figuring out? I mean, we have to be honest as well or transparent around as well, right? This embedded finance is very often a journey for companies, right? It's not like, okay, oh, yeah. there's like one thing, I do one project for three months and then I switch it on and then it's done, right? It's basically uh, opening up a new revenue channel, but also opening up a new uh, product area which you have to research and investigate and develop further. I think Shopify started with the first uh, embedded finance product in 2016, 17 and had, I think it took a couple of years until us fintech people recognized Shopify as a, a very important fintech player, right? So and I think the same is, is applicable to others as well. So that's what I said before, I think like being, uh, doing our part of being transparent and share what, what worked for other company, what didn't work, these kind of things is very, very important um, to, because an outsider very often who is from the non-financial brand looking at financial services, for us in the inside, it looks like maybe everything very easy. We know a lot of people and get our ways around, right? For somebody who's like new, stands from this big box and they're like, where, where do I start, right? So I think in a way, if we want to see embedded finance happening, we have to do our part as well to, to educate and, uh, and help people understand these kind of opportunity on, on, on their level, basically. Yeah, no. Uh... Totally agree, and I I would internally call this, and I've called this, yeah. mentioned this many many times. This is going to be an evolution, not yeah. a revolution. Um, so that's that's a that's great a way good. to kind of end this conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Lars, for your thoughts. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.